good morning, church. We're so glad to see all your smiling faces this morning. My name's Emily. This is Lindsay, Billy, and Ad. And Ad key set. And you know, there's something special about a kind of relaxed acoustic set. It gives us a chance to reflect and a chance to pray. And I just encourage you all to do that as we continue worshiping th together this morning.
this opportunity, God, to just be in this room, Lord, with these people who have come to learn more about you and your love for us, God. I thank you for that love, God, for times in my own life that you never gave up on me, God, when I would run far from you, God, yet you had arms wide open always for me to come back. So I thank you for that. I thank you for your grace and for your mercy, Lord. God, thank you for always defending me and being for me. Thank you for being for us. In Jesus' name.
Hey, will you guys pray with me? Father, thank you for your presence amongst us this morning. God, we pray that um, God, we pray that we've just been able to honor you, God, to singing to you, Father. For your glory, for your renown. Amen. Well, good morning, Rich Church. How you doing? Morning, Bobby. Yeah, hey, somebody even said good morning, Bobby. I like it. All right. Good. Hey, my name is Bobby. I'm one of the pastors here at the Ridge. We're so glad that you're with us uh, on this Sunday morning. And uh, if today's your first day here, welcome. We're glad that you chose to be here. You literally could have been anywhere this morning, but you chose to be here. And uh, we say this all the time. We don't believe that you're here by accident. We believe that you are here on purpose because God has a purpose for you being here. So welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Hey, uh, if you are here for the first time, or maybe you've just been here for a whole lot of times, there's an easy way for you to connect with us, and you see a couple of ways on the screen there. Uh, first of all, you can send us a text message to 865-276-8107, and if you're here for the first time, just use the keyword hello, or we actually have a really easy way right in front of you. You see there, it's one of those QR codes right there in front of you. We've been using those a lot here, you know, over the last year, thanks to the pandemic, you know, you go to a restaurant, you sit down, you snap a picture of it. So you can literally just take your phone out, snap a picture of it, and it will send you to our connect card and you can fill that out online. And so if you're here for the first time, we would love for you to do that because we would love to get to know you. But if you've been here a lot, that's an easy way for you to let us know how we can be praying with you or 
maybe you're ready to take a next step. You want to know how to get involved in a connect group. You want to maybe uh, start serving or whatever it is. Like We want to hear from you, and that is the easiest and quickest way that you can do that. And if you are here for the first time, as you leave today, if you've not done so yet, right outside these doors here, there's a table there called Ridge Central. Uh, stop by there. We've got a free gift for you for being here uh, today. Two other things I want to let you know about, speaking of next steps, some of you may be ready to take that next step in baptism. And so we would love to talk to you about that, about getting baptized. And so if you've never been baptized or you maybe were baptized a long time ago, maybe as, as a kid, and it was before you, re- you met Jesus, before you really knew what all that meant, we would love to have a conversation with you and get you set up for baptism. And so you can use that QR code right there in front of, it, in front of you that goes to our Connect card. Let us know on the Connect card that baptism might be your next step, and we will get in touch with you this week. One other thing is, is you have one of these envelopes in your seat there. Uh, today is Dollar Club Sunday. We typically do Dollar Club Sunday the first Sunday of the month, but that was Easter. That was last week, so we're doing it today. And uh, you can hold on to this until the end of today's service, but inside of this envelope, we just want you to put a dollar in there. If you have a dollar in cash, or you can go online to ridgegive.com, and you can just select Dollar Club in the drop down, and you can select Dollar Club there to, to give a dollar or $2,000, whatever it is that you want to give, like it's totally okay. The reason why we do Dollar Club is because we love to make an impact in our community. And this year, we're taking all of our Dollar Club money and we're giving it back to you. We're actually putting it back into your hands and helping fund your Dollar Club Go projects. And so what Dollar Club Go projects are is where you go out in your community, where you live, work, and play, and you actually make an impact there. And so we're actually funding your projects. So if you have a way to help impact the community around you, we want to help you do that. And so that's what Dollar Club Go projects are all about. And so every time you give to Dollar Club, that's where that money is going, is going right back out in to the community. We'll talk about regular giving at the end of today's service, but we're starting a brand new series today called This Is Us, about having a Christ-centered family, and our executive pastor, Wesley Hicks, is going to kick that off for us here in just a moment. So let me pray for us, and we'll continue with today's service. Father, thank you for just, um, God, for who you are, for all you're doing amongst us and, and in us. God, we pray that as the word is open, Father, you open our hearts and our ears and our eyes, God. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see, Father. And speak deeply to our soul. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Everybody good after Easter? Easter hangover? We all we all set? Is that a thing? Easter hangover? I don't I don't really know. I made it up, um, but I feel like it could be if you really zoned in on the chocolate bunnies, which is what I would be tempted to do. So hey, we are going to start off our new series. This is us, and it really is about family. Like, what does it look like in the the family of God, in our family structures, and not only our family structure, but also what does it look like in singlehood? What does it look like to be a parent? So you may be in here and you're like, well, okay, one, I'm not married. Okay, that you might think that that presents a problem when today's sermon is about marriage. But the reality is, no, it should not present a problem because if you are single and let's say you're thinking, hey, I really do want to be married. I feel like this is something God has called me toward. Then we should look to marry a person that actually meets the criteria laid out in the scripture. Like we don't look for people, right, and then to figure out ways to fix them to make them fit the model of scripture listen that never works they'll just be as jacked up in marriage as they are right now but we got to look for that so i would say if you're single don't check out Uh, if you're married guess what today is one that focuses on married life so we're going to dive into that on a deeper topic bobby said my name is wes i'm one of the pastors here so we're going to pray and we're going to dive in and see what god's word says and hopefully we will leave here motivated 
to not only have deeper and more fulfilling marriages, but also to have marriages that impact other marriages. Because guess what? Our mission is to help others follow Jesus. So we do that first in our homes, but we're also called to do that in others. So other families, other marriages, in our community, in our neighborhood, in our friends, to be a blessing, to see their families, their marriages live for the glory of God. You can't just keep this to yourself. The gospel was never intended for that. And it applies in every area of our lives. So are you with me? All right, cool. Well, let's pray. And I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. One, I'm going to ask you to pray for me. But this is just a prayer that's really been rocking me for a few days. It's one I read out of this a Puritan prayer book. But uh, we're just going to read a, a sample of it. And here he goes. It says, Father, as the sun is full of light, and the oceans are full of water, and the heavens are full of your glory. May my heart be filled with thee. Amen. All right. So the soul of a marriage can be a resting place where two people can come together quietly for, from the struggles of the world and feel safe and accepted and loved. Or, or it can be a battleground where two egos are locked in a lifelong struggle for supremacy, a battle which is for the most part invisible to the rest of the world. This is from a book called The Taste of New Wine by Keith Miller, and I think that's a very, very true statement when we think of marriage. It really is supposed to be, and it can be, a place where we find rest and hope and a refueling of the fire that the world can kind of suck out of our lives. But when we are in a marriage that is struggling or fighting against each other, pulling apart instead of pushing together, even though the people around us may think we have the greatest marriage, because guess what? We put on really good masks. It really may be falling apart on the inside. There's this prayer that when we had recovery here, we said it often, and you may be familiar with it, the serenity prayer. And it goes like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I, can ch I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And you may be thinking, well, why are we doing a recovery prayer during a marriage sermon. It's simple. There are just some things in marriage that are beyond your control. Just some things you can't control. You can't dictate how your spouse is or how they treat you or what their heart is like. How they approach marriage or how they handle conflict or even their attitude, right? That's their place of ownership. That's not yours. You cannot control that or dictate that. But one constant that you can control is your perspective in marriage or your purpose in marriage, your approach in marriage. Who you are in your role as husband or wife is totally within your purview. And how they respond, guess what? That's really on God's part to control and change and move in their heart. So we have to understand there are moments in life that we cannot change things, but there are places of responsibility in your life and in my life that we are responsible to change. And this is going to be what we talk about today. We're going to look at what God has called us to be in our roles as husband and as wife, and then also in our role as husband and wife and as a married couple to actually impact others, to see their marriage glorify God along with yours. It's really what we are made to do. Like, we are not made to be, you know, a, a dead sea, so to speak, where all these rivers flow into, but nothing goes out and we become toxic. Instead, we're supposed to be a spring of life that overflows and impacts every single person around us. So this is the goal, right? So how do we get there, and what do we see in that? You see, in Genesis 2.15, we start to get with some of the first things that God ever really says, at least what's recorded, and him saying or giving us as commands and as blessing as people. And we have all, and we'll see this in 2.15, we have all been sent out to cultivate and care. Listen to this. In 2.15, the Lord God took the man and he placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And you can get into the original languages of this, this work it and watch over it. It really comes down to a word cultivate. Anyone here do gardening? I know you guys do. We do at our house. Kim, like some of us garden. And the fact is not every plant is the same. 
You treat each one accordingly, right? So there are different approaches to different people in our lives to actually cultivate a relationship. Like you can't treat everyone the same way and expect the same results. But here we see this very clear command of God to Adam to, to cultivate. This is also a key word in which we get this word. Have you guys heard of this word culture? What is the culture of your marriage? What is the culture that we live in? Like culture and cultivate is a result. The culture is the result of cultivating. What we put into, what we actually make and build around us is the resulting culture. Does that make sense? Are we tracking? Right, so in 2.15, we are called to cultivate, to work, to develop, to bear fruit. So the question I would start with is, what's the first real command of, or the blessing of God to a husband and wife? You guys know? It, I'm just curious. I didn't really ever think about it, so I'm going to be honest, I... I didn't think, oh, yeah, I know that. I memorized it. It was one of those I actually just had to go and look. Anybody honor students? It's fine. All right, cool. I'm not alone. This is good. All right, so in Genesis 1, 28, here's where we see this first command or this first blessing recorded, you know, of God speaking to husband and wife. And he says in verse 128, God bless them. And God said to them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth to subdue it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. So he gives us this command, right, to be fruitful and to multiply. And you partner this with that verse in chapter 2, to be fruitful, to multiply, to cultivate. And we think of it in the context, like this is not just about having kids or making babies. Like that is one aspect to it, and it's a, it's a good thing, right? But it's a, such a bigger picture. Like God did not call us to limit our impact into just making babies, but to multiply not only in number, but also in impact, in culture, in cultivating, in impacting other people. And we can see this even throughout Scripture, right, where we were not to go, like God's people weren't to go and to be consumed by the land, to be transformed by the land, but to go in and actually live out faithfully what God has called, to make a difference and, and change even the society around them. Even when we get into New Testament teaching, what is the call? To make disciples. And when we think about helping others follow Jesus, like that's my responsibility to help you, right? Well, what is your responsibility? See, all of us, when we leave this building, the responsibility is to help others follow Jesus. Well, if that's true, if we have a responsibility to multiply what God has given us and what God has charged us with, then the natural, logical takeaway is that also applies in our marriages. That we should help others to have God-honoring, God-glorifying marriage. And I think if we are honest, we look around at the world that is surrounding us at this moment, I think we have fallen short. And I'm not talking about just Ridge Church. I mean, in our society, we as Christians, for the most part, may have fallen short and missed the mark here. For Christians, we have just a higher divorce rate than anyone else, like non-Christians aside. We approach marriage from incorrect approaches, right? We, we don't seek to honor God first. We seek to honor ourselves. And guess what? We live in a culture now that is all about what? Honoring themselves. I really believe that if we as Christians live out our marriages in the way that God has called us and then start to live that out in a way that multiplies and impacts other people, when people see that Christians living in marriage leaves a difference and makes a difference, it has changed and gives us joy and delight and rest, then I truly believe that the world will take notice and see something worth pursuing. I just believe that. I believe that God gives us life. He doesn't give us death. He, he calls us to something more. I'm not saying it's easy because it's not. And it can't be about you, but about him. But I believe that when we live like that, it makes a difference. And I believe that God then uses our faithfulness to transform the lives of the culture around us. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. I've seen it in God's word. I've seen it in my life. So I guess the question is, have you thought about your role in cultivating, not just in your marriage, but yes, in your marriage? in your marriage, and then in the lives of other people around you? Have you thought about your impact on the well-being of your own marriage? 
Like, do you know that you actually have a part to play in your marriage about how healthy it is? That might seem like a weird question or statement, but it is true. Like, we can't be complacent and expect it to go well. Have you thought about your role? Your impact on the marriages around you and the future marriages that will be impacted by you. Have you thought about your responsibility with the people around you? Now, this starts to get heavier. Anyone feeling this a little bit, a little more pressure? Right? Like, you mean I'm responsible not only for my own marriage, but for my neighbor? Absolutely, you are. Absolutely. God has called us as Christians to live selfless lives, which means we live about him and for the glory of this king to make a difference. So here is the question. What type of marital quality should we cultivate? And what should we multiply? This is where we're going to get into the meat of the scripture. It's in Ephesians 5. And I would just simply say this, that this is a hard set of scripture, quite honestly. Not because it's hard to understand, but because, honestly, it cuts against the grain of what our culture would tell us, 100%. It even cuts against your own natural desire, because it's a whole lot easier and it's a whole lot more natural for us to want to be selfish. Every single one of us seem to fight for our own rights, right? That's the way we are turned. That's the way that our world has taught us. But in this sense, we do not have room for that. Because, listen, here in verse 21... Listen to this. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Already coming out swinging, right? Wives, <laughs> submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to, su- uh, to submit to their husbands in everything. Now, we may think that that might be the hardest part in this set of scripture, but really it's not. Listen to this next part. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot, a wrinkle, or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members of the body, for this reason a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. You see, in this set of scripture, we come to two really strong words that just impact us deeply, submission and respect. Anyone like those words? Let's just be real. Like those kind of automatically, when you hear it, it's like, eh, gut punch, right? Like, I don't know. But listen, how you feel about it is irrelevant, quite honestly. It's what God's word has commanded and called us to. This is where we have to ask the question, am I willing to trust the word of God and submit to its authority, or do I trust my instinct and gut desire more? It's not about whether you like it or love it. It's about whether you trust it. Do you believe the word of God is real? Because listen, we can't take part and leave part. We either accept the whole Or reject it all. Because to only take pieces that you feel comfortable with is to reject the word of God. Because you're essentially saying, I don't trust you fully. Well, if you don't trust me fully, and this is real, like you don't trust me fully, you don't trust me at all. How can we not approach God's word with full trust? If we trust it halfway, we do not trust this king. So these are hard words. But but they're beautiful words. That's the thing. Like our culture would tell us that this is ugly, this is difficult, this is hard, this is, this is one-sided. But in fact, the reality is this isn't the most beautiful picture of a functional, glorifying marriage. And let me explain. Listen to this. We can see this from two perspectives in Jesus' life. Like, let's don't look at this and say, well, let's look at Wesley and Courtney's marriage and see if this models this. The fact is, is it doesn't. Not great. We're imperfect. We try, but we fail so often. So if you looked at us through a microscope, you'd be like, man, they're jacked up. Uh, Because marriage is not easy. I have to die to myself every single day to be a good, godly husband. And who here likes dying daily and thinks it's easy? Anybody? 
No, it's cakewalk. Yeah, I don't I die every day, all the time. Did it before I said no to coffee, right? Like that's no, it's hard. So I'm not perfect. So let's not look at it through my life right now. Let's look at it through the life of someone that matters way more than I ever will. Jesus. So let's talk about submission. Let's talk about submission. First point, fully God, yet God, as Jesus is fully God, he submits to the authority of God the Father. Right? He was asked, and he said, I came to do the will of the Father. He gives, submits to the Father. I want you to think about this. He willingly does this. He does this. And this is what it leads to, this blessed communion of God in three persons, yet fully and equally. They are exactly the same. They are still fully God. There's nothing lacking in any of these three persons. They are all one God, three persons, lived out in perfect communion. And yet, there was a dynamic submission to authority within the Godhead. You see the Spirit, what, what happens when Jesus went to heaven? What did he say he was going to do? He said he was going to do what? Send what? Send the Holy Spirit, which means the Spirit is going to listen to the authority of Jesus Christ and come on his behalf. Does that degrade the Spirit? Does it make him less Spirit? Less God? Does Jesus in submission to the father coming to walk on this planet to live to be crucified and resurrected does that make him less god no we see a beautiful sense of submission within equality think about that submission doesn't mean in unequal jesus even with pontius pilate because here's the reality Pontius Pilate was standing before the king of the universe, yet Pontius Pilate was the one that sent him to the cross. And Jesus, guess what he did? Willingly. Where did he go? To the cross. Pilate wasn't perfect. In fact, he was constantly in trouble with Rome. He was oppressive, greedy, stubborn, cruel. He antagonized the Jews often. And in no way was he a man that was deserving of respect. Yet Jesus submitted to his authority in this moment. Then we can see it here. So we talk about submission. What about his sacrificial love? Because guess what, guys? Fellas, this has called us to live out a life of sacrificial love, putting yourself behind the needs of your wife. Well, let's don't look at it from Wesley's perspective. Let's, let's see what Jesus did. We can see this in two perspectives in Jesus' life as well. And really, there's more perspectives. I just didn't want to take you up for like seven hours today talking about how Jesus was loving, submissive to the Father. Like, you would hate me by that time, right? But the reality is there are way more than two ways. Listen to this. Jesus, the day before his death, he washed the feet of his disciples, an act of sacrificial love. One can make the argument, well, they were Jesus' all-star team, and it kind of makes sense, except for the fact that Judas Iscariot was of these 12 men having his feet washed, and Jesus knew that he was going to be betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Submission and so, or sacrificial love to the one that would betray him and ultimately lead him to the cross. Jesus served his all-stars, quote-unquote, but he also served his betrayer. You see, the sacrificial love wasn't regulated or dictated by the deserving nature of the other person, but it was given on it from the behalf of the giver. And it goes the same for submission. Another way, he ultimately, ultimately Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. And the truth is, not one of us in this room have earned that sacrifice. We are not deserving of his death and resurrection like we weren't deserving of that he gives that to us out of his grace and goodness he loved us even though we were undeserving so here's the challenge right for the wife that may be thinking well my husband doesn't deserve my respect he hasn't earned it the challenge isn't for you to be respectful or submissive when he's earned it the challenge is will you be respectful and submissive when you're to your husband's authority even when he doesn't deserve it because it's easy to be kind when someone else is kind to you. But the call of the Christian is not to be kind when kindness is due, but to give kindness to everyone. The call of the Christian wife is to be respectful and submissive regardless of the husband's deserving. Now, does this mean that this is to be abused or steamrolled? No. 
my hope and prayer for the Christian wife is she's married to a Christian husband that is submitted to the authority of God because our responsibility may be even higher. I would say and argue that it is. You are called to be submissive and respectful regardless. It's not willing, will you be willing to submit to what your husband says? It's will you be willing to submit to God's authority? Like I'm not coming in here with hard sayings to blow your mind or to hurt your feelings or to make you angry or say women's lib. Woo. Like that's not my goal. In fact, these aren't even my words. The Bible lays this out that this is what biblical marriage looks like. So will you clearly, will you submit to what God has clearly called you in Scripture? Deserving or not, God has laid out a way for marriage that maximizes his glory. And ultimately, your submission to your husband has nothing to do with your husband. It has to do with your living for the glory of God. Because when we live out as God has called us, we are living out as a reflection of what we believe to be true, that God's word is true. It is real, and it has power. And I as a follower of Christ, have submitted to the authority of God's word. It has nothing to do with your husband. It's just the way that you live out your faith. Now, for the husband, you're like, yeah, got ladies, get it together, right? Let me just tell you, guys, this is not something for us to abuse. This is something for us to put on a pedestal and love and sacrifice for. This is why I think this is actually harder. Listen to this. For the husband, to love your, li- your wife like Christ loves the church should be one of the most, if not the most, challenging pieces of Scripture that you will ever come across. Because the reality of this piece of Scripture is, is that there is no room for you to be self-centered and selfish. Everything about your life as a husband is to be lived out in sacrifice to your wife. Because guess what? Jesus' entire life was lived out as a sacrifice for his church. You have, I, I tell guys in marriage counseling and pre-marriage counseling, I say you get no days off. And when I mean no days off, you don't get a break. You are called in the first place of ministry as a, it, it is as a husband. I'm not a pastor here first. I'm a husband first. And if my pastoring gets in the way of me being a good husband, then I will quit pastoring. I had a pastor once tell me that I had to make a choice between my family and ministry because ministry was ultimate. And I said, that's easy. I quit. And I walked out, I haven't, I've been back one time to that church because some family members go there. It wasn't even a difficult decision to make. God has clearly laid out that I am to sacrifice everything for my wife. So yeah, we can say I want to go play golf on Saturday, but let me tell you this, if golf is more important to you than the time with your wife, then you are unfaithful to God's word. If your hobby comes in between you and your wife, if this is something that is taking away time and, and remember your vows to cherish your wife, if you are not cherishing your wife because you cherish something else, you are unfaithful to God and unfaithful to your wife. I think this is one of the hardest pieces of Scripture. There are no days off. You can ask my wife. I take very few days for, for guy days. And it's not because like she doesn't let me. She encourages me to go out with the guys. But the fact is, God has called me to something different. So do I do things? Yeah. Like my small group, a few of you are in here. What time is our small group? It's on a Saturday morning at 7 a.m. Anybody know why? Anybody want to say why? Daniel, why? So we can get back home because our families are more important than our small group. So we do it in a way that it doesn't take away from our wives or our children. We get so few times and moments with our families we have to make them a priority and this is where the dis- dissolution of the family comes in where men have failed to be the men that God has called us to be you want to see a family rock look at the, stati- uh, the statistics when we fail men families fail this is one of the heaviest pieces of scripture there are no days off The moment you get married, you have engaged in your primary place of ministry as a Christian. God has called you to serve your wife, to love your wife. And Jesus took no days off in this. You must love your wife at the expense of every single breath and every single heartbeat. So the beauty of this is that these two are completely complementarian. Don't you see how these work? When a husband loves his wife as if she's the only thing that matters, 
doesn't that, ladies, make it a lot easier to be respectful and submissive to that husband? Because you know, you know in your heart the only thing he wants to do is to bless you. Well, that's easy to submit to. That's easy to respect. When a guy, his whole life is to be lived in service to God and to you, even to the extent that it would mean we would put our lives first. I always tell Hudson that if somebody's picking on a sister, I said the boy goes down and the girl goes free. You get in there and you get in a fight. I don't care if you get whipped. You take care of your sister. You take care of, of the defenses. You fight for someone that you have to, but you do not let your, your future girlfriend, he's five, so this ain't now, right? <laughs> yeah. You can imagine how these conversations are. He's probably sitting there like, Dad, I just want to watch Dino, Dino Dana, you know. <laughs> See it. But the reality is, hey, son, I'm the one that goes downstairs when there's a bump in the night. I'm the one that, you know what, something goes down. I'm the one going outside. My wife is not. Man, if you're sending your wives downstairs because you hit a bump in the night, you need to man up. I'll just go ahead and tell you, you're a <laughs> sissy. I'll just tell you. We spend too much time playing video games instead of being men. Man up. No days off. Live as if you deserve the wife that God gave you. And love her with everything you have. The upshot of Paul's points through verse 25 and 33 is to show the dignity and privilege and vital importance of husbands loving their own wives. You see, the husband's interests and purposes in his wife's submission are not for his own honor and status, but in turn for his headship on it, uh, to turn his headship on its head by loving his wife self-sacrificially in imitation of how Jesus loves us. And likewise, wives also mirror this relationship by modeling the church's respectful and pure conduct toward her loving Savior by submitting to their husbands. It's not a slavish terror, but a profound measure of respect because her husband, or for her husband. This is something that Jack Gibson helpfully concludes. He says, rather than focusing on the, uh, the rights of the husband and wives, rather than providing financial incentives for the promotion of marriage, Paul drove right into the heart of marital unity by presenting the sacrifice of Christ on the cross as the model for the relationship of the husband to the wife. The husband is called to be a willing sacrifice, everything for his wife, up to and including his life. For the husband, this is what it means for him to love his wife. And the wife in return to respect her husband and show respect to him for his sacrifices on her behalf. A marriage characterized by such love and respect will indeed be a unified marriage. And following both balls and following balls, uh, Paul's admonition in verse 22 and 33, both husbands and wives mirror the most fundamental purposes of creation to glorify God. And to dwell in his very presence in the full enjoyment of his self-sacrificial love in Christ forever. Marriage is a role and a place where we live out our roles in a, complement, a complementarian fashion. Because the reality is, guys, if, if we live out with self-sacrificial love the way Jesus has done that on the cross, the way that this is being laid out, I'm going to ask the ladies to, to respond to this. If we live this out as men, is that something that you could find yourself following for the rest of your life, trusting and respecting? Yes or no? Is that, that would be a easy, right? It would be a want to. I want, I want to respect my husband because guess what? In every single way, he lives his life as if I am the only one that matters. The fact is, like, my wife matters more than my children do. Like, I love my kids. Don't get me wrong, but if I have to choose between my kids and my wife, I choose my wife. And that might be a hard statement, especially for moms, because moms are like, I don't know. <laughs> right? <laughs> Motherly instinct. But the fact is, God has called me to be a husband before, before being a father. That doesn't mean that my kids' value are diminished or anything less. It means that when my kids see me love my wife in this manner, they have a model that actually c teaches them the gospel in their homes. And I don't care if they become good people. I care if they become good followers of Christ. If they do that, they will be good people. My prayer is that they love Jesus, not that they love the affection and respect of the people around them. I don't care about that. 
I don't care if you respect me. The fact is, I care if what I'm doing honors God. That matters more than anything. So ladies, yes, it's, it would be great, right? If a guy lives up to that standard, you're like, I am in. I, listen, I will follow him to the ends of this earth. Because I know if we go to the ends of this earth, the whole journey was for my good. Because he loves me. He loves me. I always tell guys in pre-marriage coaching, just so you know, I'm harder on the guys. And I tell them this, right? I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm going to be harder on you. Because guess what? You have a heavier burden. You've got to carry everything. And ladies, guess what? When you live in this model of submission, uh, submission and respect, you know what it makes a husband want to do? Give you the world. To love you in a way that we would give up everything. And I know you may be like, I don't know, because my husband's a turd, <laughs> right? Guess what? You're not called to live this out because he's good. You're called to live it out because of God's word. And fellas, your wife may be the most undeserving person I know or you know to have that kind of love, but it does not matter. You are called to love this way regardless of their performance. So you may be thinking, well, okay, so what if I do this and they don't change? All right, keep doing it. There are no days off. Days, the days off policy isn't dependent upon their performance. It's dependent upon your faithfulness. No days off. So when we think about this, when we think about how does this go into cultivation, let me just say, when we live in obedience to God's call in our marital roles, it will maximize our pleasure in marriage. It will also maximize our marriage's reflection on the glory of God. And when we live like this, not only does it cultivate a God's gloriness in our homes, but it also then begins to impact the people around us because guess what people notice? Especially married people. Why is our marriage so much worse than theirs? Right? We don't say theirs is so much better. Ours is worse because we always internalize it, don't we? Don't we always think, like, oh, well, pff, kick the can down the road. This is all on me. People start to notice when, when their marriage is different. I'm serious. Like, when we live out this faithfully, I believe that God will use that for his glory, and it will impact people around us, especially when we go places and people see us being different. Like, I've had people say stuff to me. It's like, yeah, man, well, you're always really kind to your wife, and you always try to make sure, she, like, I don't care what we have for dinner. I just try, which is always the argument anyways. I don't know why I went here. Right, this is a bad one. What are we having for dinner? I don't care. You pick. Okay, Chinese now. Okay, then you didn't want me to pick. Go ahead and pick. <laughs> right, that's really what happens. But the fact is, is I typically try to just say, hey, you know, let's see what they want. So we choose these paths, and then when people notice that, they ask, well, why do you do that? Because God has called me to love my wife in a way that she feels blessed, not love my wife in a way that I feel blessed. As we live this out, it will cause others to notice. And when they notice, it is an opportunity for you to open up and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not even talking about necessarily pure evangelism. I'm talking about to bless their marriage, to help them and to walk with them so that in turn, their lives will be a reflection of Christ. We are called to that. What does it take? Remember, we have sacrificial love and respect. What does this take? I believe it requires more than two things, I guess. I just don't want to go with a full-on, hey, here's a list. I hope everybody doesn't get a cramp in their hand. I mean, I guess you could just look on you version. It's there, too. But the reality is I think these two actually summarize a lot of it. It requires repentance and grace. It requires that every single day we come to terms with the fact that we probably failed yesterday. And today's a new day. And, and you know what? Your spouse or your future spouse, they probably failed yesterday too. So we're going to show them grace in their failures. And we're going to receive grace for our failures. And we're going to walk in repentance as husbands and wives. And we are going to live faithfully to God's word. And when we fail, we are going to start over again. And we are going to repent. And we are going to seek grace and show grace. And tomorrow, repeat. Because I know every day as a husband, Courtney shows me so much grace. And tomorrow she'll have to do it again. <laughs> and the next day. That's just how it is, right? 
But the reality is, is we're not in it for a week. We're in it for a lifetime. And hopefully tomorrow is a sweeter day than today. And the next day sweeter than that. And the only way that we get there is to fully lean into what the gospel is called. is to lean into Christ and to be repentant and show grace. To be sacrificial and submissive and respectful and loving and work together as husband and wives to cultivate in our marriage this type of love. And may that cultivation then impact the reality around us. So the question is, when we cultivate marriage from this perspective, right, we begin to I- impact other marriages. So here's the question. What kind of legacy is your marriage leaving? Are you impacting others around you? Are, is your marriage making a difference? What are you cultivating in your marriage? And what are you cultivating in the lives of other people? These are challenging questions, and I want you to continue to ask them after we leave the service. You don't need the answers right now. You should be reflective when you go home. And in the places where you're like, I'm not cultivating what I should, then submit that to the authority of God and begin to. And where you are, guess what? Continue to do so, but do it even better tomorrow. Do it even better the next day. Remember, repentance and grace and continue on every single day. So here are the next steps. Here's, here's what I think. This is the guidance that I would give. For husbands and wives, I will give you two things. One, submit to the authority of Scripture in relation to how we approach our marriages, our roles in marriages. And two, our role to impact and influence the marriage roles around us to a model that is biblical in its aspect. So we need to continue to apply this in ourselves, and then let's move forward to apply it in others. And listen, singles, I told you, I've got something for you, because there is actually a role for you in this. Look for these attributes in dating. Like, if you're a chick and you're like, hey, I'm trying to find a guy or I have a guy. Listen, if this guy doesn't have these attributes, if this is not him, like if he's not sacrificial and loving, kick that guy to the curb. He's a loser. I mean it. Hey, he is not worth having because guess what? You will not fix him once you say I do. A dud before is a dud after. He's just a dud. And may God change his heart and he be good for somebody else years later. But guess what? For you, he is not the right man. Don't, don't sell yourself short. Ladies, you deserve a God-honoring, God-glorifying person that will sacrifice everything for you. This is what you deserve in a man. Settle for nothing less. Listen, if a guy goes to church, that's not the bar to shoot for. We have some losers in church. And I'm not trying to be mean. Reality is, is our ladies deserve better than you. If you're that guy that doesn't live like this, guess what? You don't deserve a lady in this church. My daughter's old enough. If a dud comes in, I'm kicking him out. <laughs> I don't care. I will, listen, I'm probably a bad person to have for pre-marriage coaching. Because <laughs> I'll tell you, no, nah, you shouldn't even date. The fact is, ladies, for so long we've settled for what we don't deserve because we have this mindset that we can fix this guy. And you can't. Your job is not to fix anyone. You are a terrible doctor. God is the only one that can change the heart of a person. And short of God making a miracle happen, guess what? You will end up with your life unsatisfied with your husband. You have sold yourself short, so do better. Get rid of them. And guys, hey, this isn't just like, hey, we're the ones that messed up. Listen, there are some duds that are ladies. Same thing goes here. If she does not model this on any kind of level, she is not worth dating. Not for you. Let her go to some duds. Like, hey, put the duds together. That'll be great. (laughs) But don't settle for it if it's you. Don't settle for it. Because guess what? If you settle for it, you have no room to complain once you're married. You have no room. The person you can blame for a bad marriage in that sense because you dated a dud is yourself. Don't be mad at God. God, you called me into this. No, I don't put that on me. You called you into this. And you called yourself into this mess. Now, I can do some work here and I can fix some things, but it's going to take a moment. And quit trying to fix it because you're making it worse. Right? This is the way it would go. So, guys, ladies, singles, men, everything, like whoever you are, look for a person that models these roles 
And if you're not in one, honestly, I, I know it seems like I'm just trying to be funny, but the reality is I would beg you, if you're in a relationship and you know that what I'm describing is not your other person, as hard as it is, you've got to get rid of that guy or that girl. You deserve so much better. God brought you to hear this word. God brought you into this room to live for his glory, live for his glory. Don't settle for less. Be the person God has called you to be. If called to singleness, the way we impact others is we model God-centered relationships with others. So we model Christ's love for his bride, and we serve others with dignity and respect. So husbands and wives, love, respect, seek to cultivate your marriage and seek to cultivate it in the lives of others. And singleness, live your life faithful to God and serve others with dignity and respect. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your kindness. Thank you so much for my wife. I am so blessed with the wife that you have given me. She is gracious. She is loving. She is all that I could hope for in a wife. And God, I pray that that's the prayer for everyone in this room, for every man in this room, that you're pray, they are praying to you and asking you for the wife that you have designed for them. And every lady would ask and pray for the husband that you have designed for them. And in our marriages, that we would live out these roles faithfully, that we wouldn't use them as something to hold over someone's head, but we would do it just out of faithfulness to you because you are ultimately all that matters. You died for us so that we can have life. You have been resurrected from the dead so that our lives and our marriages wouldn't be dead anymore but they can have life so God move in our lives change us that we would be more like you you are all that matters it's time for us Father to repent and to give you everything even this illusion of control that we have in our marriage so God we praise you and we bless your name and we ask this all in Jesus name amen
Amen. Let's give it up. Hey, before you head out real quick, a couple of things. Number one, you know, Wesley laid out some challenges for all of us. Uh, for those of us who are married, those of us who are thinking about being married, those of us who will be married one day, right? These are, these are challenges for all of us to step into according to the Word of God, and we want to help you take that step and help you rise to that challenge. But here's the thing. Maybe you, you hear some of that and you think, I just don't know. I, I don't know if that's for me. I don't know if... I just don't know if I can get there. And I would just say this to you. Just be reminded, just like we just sang, that the promise of God still stands. And what did he promise us? He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And he's always going to be with us. So any time, every time we think that it's hard, just remember that there is someone there with us in the trenches. Amen? And that's good news. Well, hey, let us help you take that next step, that Connect card that you see or the QR code that you see there. Make sure to just snap a picture of that. Fill out the Connect card real quick. Let us know, hey, this is my next step, or this is how you can pray for me. This is how you can pray for me and my spouse, or I'm ready to take the next step into baptism or, or getting involved in some way. So before you leave, do that here today. And then on our way out, don't forget, Dollar Club envelopes are right there in front of you if you want to give to Dollar Club. But our regular giving is happening as well, and you can just go to ridgegive.com online, and you can give safely and securely there, or we have ushers in the back as you leave. You can uh, give your offering that way. If you're here for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. We don't want you to feel obligated at all to give. We're just glad that you're here. So let me pray for us, and we will be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for your word today. God, we pray that your word just empowers us, God. God, just reminds us that you are the one who holds all things in your hands, God, and you hold everything together. And Father, you even hold us together. So Father, we pray that as we give, as we go out of these doors, Father, let us give generously, let us give sacrificially, and with glad and joyous hearts, and be with us as we go from here. It's in your name we pray. 
Amen. You guys have a great week.